Hello and welcome to episode four of the Inside Track brought to you by William Hill, where we are back after a stellar Christmas period. But we're not done yet, though, because the top class racing continues into the new year. But we don't mind back to back action when it's this good and this competitive, though, anyway, do we? And on this week's show, we will be reviewing the key festive racing. We will also be looking ahead to the Mayor's Hurdle as our anti post race in focus. As well as that, we will be looking ahead to the nearer future of this weekend, where we'll be looking at some of the feature races at Newbury and Cheltenham. And I will be doing all of this in tip top company because I'm delighted to say that this week we are being joined by William Hill and as well as broadcasting royalty, Nick Luck. Nick, definitely the shoe on the other foot in terms of a podcast this week, but how are you? I'm very well, Kate. Though, though with that introduction, you can be sure that my tiara is going to slip at some point during the course of the, <laughs> the, next, uh, the next hour or so. But uh, yeah, no, it's great to be with you. And it, it's not uh, never a hardship to be reviewing what we've been enjoying over the last few days. It's been just sensational. Oh, it has been completely, hasn't it? it? It really, it's just, you don't know exactly where to look. I think the, the button on my remote has been worn out from trying to flip between different channels, but of course it's going to be great to get your insight as you were very much on the ground, seeing it all in person. And James Mackey with us back again. James, I trust you had a good Christmas. Oh, lovely Christmas, yeah. Lovely spending it with family. And obviously I spent most of the time watching the racing. Great racing over the Christmas period. Uh, and I think we've got a lot to go through, haven't we? In terms of what happened at the Christmas um, period and what happened in the Cheltenham Festival markets as well for 2023. Yeah, so looking forward to this show. Yeah, exactly. So, so much to talk about on this week's show. So we'll try and keep it as condensed as we can. But yeah, this is going to be a bumper edition for sure. Now, Nick, before we kick on to the talking about the racing proper, of course, we've been getting from all of our guests their favourite Cheltenham Festival memories. You have seen a fair few festivals then in your time in the broadcasting role. So any memories that really stick out for you or your ultimate highlight of the festival? Yeah, Gold Cup Day 2008. Kate was my favourite Cheltenham Festival day that I've attended anyway in person because it was the year when the Wednesday was abandoned because of the high winds and they concertinaed I think nine races into Thursday and, and 10 into Friday and amongst the 10 on Friday was was Denman's Gold Cup and uh, it, it became so tribal that year you were either a Denman or a Corso I was very much a Denman that year and just to see him do what he did I I still think it's one of the most exhilarating performances I've ever seen on a race course. It, it had everything that day, including the performance the day deserved. So, yeah, that would that would definitely stand out. Yeah, I'd say that would be very high up in most people's memories then of the festival when I was also team Dem and team the tank as well in that race anyway. And it really was to be there in person must have been unbelievable. Now we are going to look ahead now to our review segment of this podcast. So we're going to try and talk about as much as we possibly can. And starting with the feature race post Christmas, though, which was the King George the sixth chase one again by that man. Paul Nichols with Brave Man's Game, who was a dominant winner, despite not much really going right for him throughout the race, though, Nick. So your thoughts, please, on the race. It's funny, isn't it? If you go into a race with a kind of lukewarm, tepid opinion about a horse and then they do something that surprises you, you then go the other way and start forming a very positive opinion of them. And that really is, is, is my deal with Brave Man's Game. I thought he was a thoroughly admirable horse. I didn't think it was beyond the bounds of possibility that he'd win the race. But when I saw him and Lompresse hook up at the top of the straight, I thought, well, Lompresse will probably out gallop him from here. And far from it, it really was the other way around. I don't. I think it would have been fairly close. I think there would only have been a length, length and a half in it at the line if, if Charlie Deutsch hadn't come off Lompresse. But the fact that Brave Man's game had to go so wide was being carried out to his left the whole time and still snap back on the bridle two out and then stayed on really powerfully and hit the line much harder than I've ever seen him do before, made me think, why shouldn't he be a meaningful Gold Cup contender? And, and I think the market has tried to be too sophisticated for the Gold Cup. It's trying to overthink the race and say, well, Lompresse is going to beat him going the other way round and is going to stay three and a quarter miles better. Mm. I, I concede a bit on the first of those points. I will concede nothing on the second because there's no evidence if you look at both horses' overall career profiles that Lompresse is a stronger stayer than Brave Man's game. So in a year where we didn't see Aplutar yesterday, he fluffed his lines at Haydock, mixed messages coming out of Ireland as to what really is the the, the, the next star. If it's if it's not um, Galapin Deschamps, I'd be very surprised. But in terms of opposition to Galapin Deschamps, um, I think Brave Man's game, why shouldn't he be at the forefront? 
Oh, so completely flipped around them with your view, which I, I'm I'm all here for waving the tiny little union jack right now. So as long as we can have something to at least match the Irish come the Gold Cup, then I'm all for it. Now, James, Brave Man's game was a 20 to 1 shot with William Hill before the King George, now cut into 8 to 1, though. Long press they pushed out from 6 to 1, just only to 7 to 1 anyway. And the favourite Galloping Day shot was actually nipped in uh, from 7 to 4 to 6 to 4. But of course, we do did have the Savile chase on Wednesday at Leopard Sound, won by Conflated. Now 12 to 1 shot for the Gold Cup from 20 to 1. So can you please contextualise the market moves for us and your opinion on both the King George and the Savile's Chase? Yeah, definitely. Look, when, when you talk about both these races, everything's going to go back to the Gold Cup. There is going to be races before, but as we know with Brave Man's game, Paul Nichols stayed that this horse goes, goes best fresh. It's going to go straight to the Gold Cup. That makes things interesting again, doesn't it? Because you've got the Irish Gold Cup in the middle that probably conflated. He might go straight to the Gold Cup after this, and I think probably should have gone to the Gold Cup last year. I think what Gordon Elliott said in his interview after that was probably the case looking back now, but in, in hindsight's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Every year with these horses. So yeah, look at the prices. Galloping the Champ, he's, he's short at six to four when he's never run over the trip. I still personally think he will get the trip, no problem. But what I love about this horse, Galloping the Champs, and when you, when you relate it back to horses like Constitution Hill as well, they're just these freaks, aren't they? They're these freaks that we need in the sport that you just look at and think, I just don't know what's going to beat this horse. But when you're looking from a, a punting angle and at six to four at this, at, well, at this time leading up to the Gold Cup, you want to look elsewhere, don't you? And offering in Brave is Man's he, game. Is he, is, he going to be any, is he going to be any bigger on the day? That's what you've got to ask yourself, isn't it? Exactly. Exactly. Probably, That's the case. Probably. Or is he going to be any shorter on the day? Sorry. Probably not. No, you, you are right. You are right. But then again, even though Willie Mullins comes out and said, oh, yeah, he'll stay no problem over the trip. For me, it's very it's ridiculous to be back in a horse at six to four when you've never seen over the Gold Cup trip. Personally, for me, the Gold Cup isn't about the best horses. It's about the best stayers. Um, mm -hmm. I might be wrong in that. And it might we might come to see when it comes to March. And Galloping the Champs might have the lot. Um, but for what at the moment, when you were talking about Brave Man's game then, Nick, you, I think the the common consensus was this horse doesn't stay. Well, you can't say that anymore because this horse does stay. That he might not he might not stay as well as others, but he definitely gets there. Long press for me was the out and out stayer going into that into, into that race, the King George. Um, and and for me, I came out saying the opposite. When Brave Man's came was off the bridle, I thought he slightly got Harry Cobden out a little bit of a trouble really because if you if you look tactically at that race, it probably didn't go as well as well as Harry wanted it to go. But if you look at the horse coming back off the bridle to come next to Long Press, jump in what the last, and yes, there probably only would have been a length, two lengths in it, but still, Brave Man's game was the out, outright winner, would have gone and win the race. And, and at eight to one, um, look, he's going a different, different way around, and it's not as flat a track as Kempton. So there is little bits you need to look at, but from 20s into eight to one, there's worse shouts, isn't there? And Brave Man's game against Long Press again, I'm really excited to see, but it's going to be a fascinating Gold Cup. But at this moment in time, yes, I like Gallim Chance. I absolutely love the horse. And you've got to make that decision. Is he going to be bigger or shorter on the day, whether to back him now? But I would like to see him over that trip, even though Willie Mullins is the master, he's the maestro, and you, you've got to believe what he says. Um, for me, I want to see him one more time. But it's fascinating because Complay does also come into that reckoning, doesn't he, off the back of that Savile's Chase win as well. Yeah, no, he definitely does. And again, a, a supreme ride on completed yet again, back over his, his favourite course and distance on Wednesday for him. But the pair of you both touched on there, the fact that Brave Man's game did hit the line strongly. And from what we had seemingly thought of as Lon Presse as the strongest sayer coming into the King George, I say I think a fair few people's minds may just have been changed on the back of that. The fact that Brave Man's game did get every yard of that and certainly wasn't stopping at the line anyway. So it is, it's going to be fascinating market moves are all the same and whether or not you want to take Galloping Deschamps at six to four at this stage, or you think he will shorten up then, as the lads were saying, remains to be seen. Now, another race on Boxing Day at Kempton, which was certainly one for the ages, was the rescheduled long walk hurdle. Thank God we did get it rescheduled because it served us up the best post Christmas present you could have asked for. Paisley Park doing what he does best in every way. Uh, now, Nick, this horse at, and this division, I mean, does it even warrant us looking forward to the Sayers hurdle, or should we just be enjoying these races, these horses? as we find them. Well, both, I think, is the answer, Kate. Of course, we want to be looking ahead to the stairs hurdle, and you know, part of what makes Cheltenham so exciting is the anticipation. Some people say it dominates the season, but I think you can enjoy the races on the way just as much and in, enjoy the anticipation of building up to the big event. Oh, and actually, on that point, why can't Paisley Park go back and take a hand again? 
he clearly is a happier horse this season. Just the way he's moved and travelled and jumped through the Newbury race and then at Kempton the other day, a track that supposedly wasn't going to suit him, but when push comes to shove, class will 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 will, will overcome in, in, in that regard. And and I don't see any reason with Flooring Porter not quite at his best this season why Paisley Park can't come back and run another huge race in March. Yeah, he, he won very easily beating a, a, a very good horse in Goshen, who I think did stay the trip. And he is pricked over the last year's pricked at the line with a ton in hand. So um, if if Paisley Park had done that and there was a seven by his name instead of, you know, a 10 and rising 11, you'd say you'd have him right there, single figures. Yeah, he's the horse to beat come March. So I'm prepared to take it on, on face value and, and believe that he's still a big player. Oh, really? So not being deterred by the age factor whatsoever then with Paisley in terms of sort of, like you say, the form that he finds himself in is, is counter to him being 11 rising 12. Yeah. Well, clearly, you know, there, there's scope there for younger, newer horses to come through in this division. But I'd like to see where they are. You know, where are last season's best staying novice hurdlers in this division? It hasn't really worked out for Bob Ollinger, who's a horse with a touch of brilliance. But he doesn't look like a, an out and out stayer. Never did to me. Full marks to home by the Lee doing what he's done. He keeps being underestimated. And if it really turns into a war, why shouldn't he be one of the ones coming to the fore? But this, of all races, is not a race that is ever won by a horse with suspect stamina. No, exactly. Certainly so. And you say about the novices from last year, of course, the Albert Bartlett winner was out, is out for the season this year. And then the rest of them basically gone chasing. So, yeah, we don't exactly. have those new upcomers coming into the stairs to fish it. Uh, now, James, Nick did just say there about the Jack de Bromhead Christmas hurdle at Leopardstown on Wednesday, won by home by the Lee, who may well be the newcomer to this division. So for all that I'm getting sentimental about this division, uh, will you please put some cold, hard analysis to the difference between the British and the Irish staying hurdlers? Yeah, look, it, it, it's tough, isn't it, this race? And what, what Nick just said is absolutely bang on. With, with a race like this looking ahead to the festival before the stayers hurdle, it's not a race that you really go looking for your favourites. It's, it's, it's a race you look for your stayers, regardless what their age is. I think it's one of the one of the only races where everyone looks at the stats and what age this horse has got to be. I don't think you're doing this. I think you need, if you look at the results over the last few years, or probably over the last 10 years, it's thrown out some very strange results. You look at Liz Nagar Oscar, a massive prize going to win the race. It does throw out those kind of horses. Uh, and just to touch on what Nick said then about Paisley Park, I am in the same camp. You know, Kate, how much I talked about this horse before this race. Um, from an emotion side, I absolutely love the horse. Probably my favourite horse in training. Uh, but off the back of what people were saying, I oh, Kempton might not like it. It doesn't matter for me when it comes to this horse because when he hits that flat spot, he, he's always going to stay better than any horse in the race. It's just how close he is when he hits that flat spot. And when you look at Champ out in front, he's always going to come off the bridle and not find as much. And then you had the the, the little bit extra in there of, of Goshen. Did he stay the three miles? He probably did, but he didn't stay as well as Paisley Park. And for me, the 14 to 1s from 25s in the market for Paisley Park, I'll be snapping that right up. Yeah, because I, I don't care. If he, I don't care if he's, he's ten years of age at all. I think he's. I think he's still one of the best stayers around. Um, well, can you name, can you name three horses that that are going to beat him in a Grade One three mile race? That's it. You can't. You can't really, can you? No, you, you can't at all. You can't at all. Like when when we're touching about her home home by the Lee, he's probably you wouldn't have spoke about him at all at the start of the season. And and there's nothing to say anything bad about the horse. You just wouldn't have put him in the same bracket of any of these horses, like your Bob Ollingers, your Floor Importers, because he wasn't talked about. But he's obviously been very, very progressive. Obviously won the Liz Mullen hurdle, won well uh, at Leopardstown uh, over the last few days. So he's obviously a horse um, to be watching, but at seven to one in the top of the market and 14 is about Paisley. I'd rather take the experience around the track, uh, experience of staying longer than any horse I've seen compared to one that's up and coming. You could probably talk about horses in that market like Blazing Cal. Are we going to see him this season? He's had a few setbacks. And he's probably the one that's really, really interesting. But because now Charles Burns has come out and said twice that he's, he's hit setbacks, we don't know if he's going to be ready for the Cheltenham Festival. It's a very, very tough market. But from what we've looked at over the last week or so, over this Christmas period, if there was one I was going to pick out, and maybe, maybe for the reasons that I will absolutely love the horse, but of, of what he's shown... Paisley Park at 14s, I think, can go close again in in in, in another stairs hurdle for me. But it's a fascinating market, isn't it? Because we have we haven't seen, like you said, many horses like your Bob Ollinger's come out. Because I don't, I think he needs to be dropped back in trip personally, Bob Ollinger, off the back of what we've seen. I wouldn't keep him at three miles. But where do you go? I, I can't really name probably seven horses that are going to go in the race at this moment in time. We've just got to wait and see, haven't we? 
And that's what you're saying. We talk about anti-post betting at this stage and many people not being fans of it. But when you've got a horse where you know where he is going to go, Paisley Park, there is no way that Emma Lavelle is going to suddenly throw us a curveball and put Paisley Park in any other race than the Stayers hurdle. And you've both just said 14 to 1 then about him. Can you name three horses that are going to finish in front of him to push him out of the frame? When we know he's going for the race, it's very difficult to see that. So, it, yeah, Nick, you were going to say. Well, the only race he can run in between now and the realistically the only race he's likely to run in between now and the festival is the cleave hurdle yeah. they may or may not decide to run there if they don't decide to run there then his price is likely to be shorter on the day if they do decide to run there there is no doubt he will run well because he always does in that race and again his price is very likely to contract the thing about these very short price favorites already for the festival you look at that and you think well they're likely to be a bigger price on the day as the season yeah. starts to develop with paisley park you know where he's going to go you know how the season's going to develop it is that he is actually the type of horse where the, the non-runner money back concession, which is beginning on New Year's Day, is the is the way forward because um yeah, the the, the only thing that's going to play against you is something untoward or some sort of injury. So um I, I actually think I, I kind of agree with a lot of what people say about modern day anti-post betting and it's not quite what it was, but I think in this instance, there's a there's a fairly good argument for having a bet. Yeah, I, exactly. I completely agree. I completely agree. I think the, I think the 14 to 1, he, he's gone to the Cleve hurdle, what, three times now and gone on to win it three times, I think. So if he does go there, and even if he doesn't, that price of 14 to 1 is not going to be his price on the day. I, I don't think so at all. I think this is one of the races where you can look at Faisley Park and think, if I fancy this horse, I think back it now for the stays hurdle, personally. And, and you know, a, a, bang, a, a, a bang on flooring porter virtually notes that no staying hurdler in training is going to be. Yeah. But he, we know he's quirky. We know he's got something of the night about him. He's delivered twice. It's asking quite a lot for a horse of that mentality, of that fragile mental state to deliver three times. So I'd be, you know, you'd be prepared to, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Old, old adage of hurricane and penalties comes to mind then with Florin Porter. <laughs> asking him to go in and go and do exactly that again is, uh, yeah, is quite going to be something. But uh, but yeah, Florin Porter, we know the supreme talent he has around Cheltenham, but Paisley Park. Finally, we have some value in the anti-post markets to hopefully be siding with and the pair of you making solid cases for the old boy there to hopefully go in again and say his hurdle. Now, James, we're going to head back to you, please, for our novice chases because we have a whole lot to go at here. And to start, though, I'm going to start off with the grade one quarto star novices chase one by time hill over three miles in a race that fell apart to a large extent so how are we judging that for um for me it, I, I was behind McFabulous on the day even though he, he did pose questions as he stayed three miles as he did for me his hurdling days um and he probably didn't stay out again if he, if he was ever going to stay three miles it would be around a track like Kempton um time hills jumping absolutely improved didn't it from the last time those two met and that was the difference to me because when they when time hill came up sides mcfabulous you, you you just knew which way it was going to go from his hurdling days he was a grade one winner over three miles he stays all day it was just his jumpy he needed to brush up and he did but you look at you look at it don't you it, and you look at it from an, another perspective of over the last few years how the irish three miles uh three mile chase uh, novice chases have been compared to the british and I think it's that age old case again, where I think the Irish are probably going to be better than the British. I think Ty Mill's a brilliant horse. He's had a brilliant career and, and he, he maybe have gone over fences slightly later than he should have the same probably with McFabulous. But if I was going to have a look in the market for say the Brown advisory at this moment in time, off the back of what we saw over Christmas, I'd be definitely down the camp for the Irish. And the one that really, really caught my eye was Jerry Colom um, at Limerick. Uh, this horse, if he goes soft or even heavy, Come, come that race on the Wednesday, I think this could be really, really short because he he just wants a slog. There, there, there was talk about this horse even going to the National and Chase. He could go that far. And he has contracted in the market for that as well. Um, I think he's actually 14s into eights for the Brown Advisory, but he's actually 16, 16s into eights for the National and Chase as well. So you get a similar price about both. And you probably want to wait um, until the non-runner no bet concessions do go out if you want to have a look at both those bets. But for me, Jerry Colon was the one to take out of the week in terms of the three mile novice chase division, because these horses and beaten what in seven races now had a really, really lightly race career over bumper, over hurdles. And I think was bought by Rob Core to go and be a chaser. And you, you, he's been showed now 
uh, at Limerick and the time before that, yes, he doesn't win by all that much, but he, he absolutely grinds out his wins. And he's just what I love to see in a chase. He jumps well and stays well. And I think when he gets pushed, bumped up to three miles or even further in uh, in the future, he'll, he'll be an even better horse. So he was the one for me uh, in the novice chase around three miles that I, I was uh, really watching out for uh, over the Christmas period. Yeah, Jerry Colomb, like say, he still just seems to have the world at his feet, doesn't he? That horse, he could still be absolutely anything going forwards. Now, Nick, you must have had an extra bit of interest in the, well, two and a half mile to the staying uh, division then of the novice chasers, because you have a very close connection to a certain gentleman's game who was so impressive on his chasing debut at Leopardstown on Wednesday, running over two mile five. And he is obviously in one of your, one of your horses in your five to follow for the season. So just how much Joy did that success for a horse bred by your mother give you as an um, apology. <laughs> the, cat, the cat enjoyed it as well. Yeah, the cat loved it. <laughs> um, well, I'm actually I'm actually recording this. I'm staying down with my brother and we watched it together and we were giving it a good a good roar, I can tell you. My mum would have loved that. Uh, I, I actually bought the dam of this um of this horse at Dogs to Sales. I'd gone up there to sell a foal. Um and I, I, I must have been hanging around too long before I had to get the train home. Uh, I thought I would get her for less than we did end up, end up having to pay for it, but still, she she looks quite well bought given what our progeny have done now. Mm. Um, and yeah, he he's a he's a a very talented horse. This um, he, he he's a great enthusiast. He he gallops and jumps. He's not super fast, but he's got a good you know in terms of having a, an electric turn of foot. But he's got a a good high cruising speed, and he he wants he wants to race, and he's been campaigned sparingly to this point so you'd like to think he could move forward do i think he has the the brilliance to to win the the three mile novice chase say at, at the festival I'm, I'm not so sure in a in a year where that picture is quite opaque but certainly you you'd think any trip's not going to be a problem for him and and if they do end up going to cheltenham this time i'd imagine it'll be in the in the national hunt chase at three and three quarter miles i mean i hate the fact that they brought the distance of that race back. Cause I think you were effectively looking at the same pool of horses for two races. And if you're talking about dilution of talent, you're really, what is the point of basically having a first division and a second division of the same race and the same bunch of horses. You look at the markets for the two of them. It's the, the, the you know, the shaded area in the, in the Venn diagram is, is, is pretty significant. Um, anyway, that's a, a slight digression. I think gentleman's game is a, is a smashing horse. I wouldn't be surprised if the race for him somewhere down the line was something like the Irish National. But if they do do that, I think it wants to be this season as a novice before his handicap mark gets blown out of the water. Yeah, and I mean that record, that race has such a good record for the novices within it anyway, doesn't it? But he's 16 to 1 for both the uh, the Brown Advisory, the XRSA, and also then the National Hunt Chase as well. He's also a 16 to 1 shot for that. But like you say, there we definitely have a huge crossover then of the Venn diagram between the horses for both of those races. But a horse that is is, is high in the thinking of many people well, anyway for the same novice chase division. Well, Kate, look at a horse like Guy de Manil, for example, who's had stacks of chasing experience now. Yeah, it, there'd be no question what race that that horse would go for. He'd you know go for the race in Dublin and then go to the what's now the Brown Advisory. Yeah. Your horse like him shouldn't really be running in what was the old four miler, but the chances are it's no three six. He's a strong stayer. Patrick Mullins will be pushing for it. He's five to four for that race. It's just it's it, it, it. I don't think that this is a. It's it's not good for competition what they've done by making these races too similar. Yeah, exactly. Like you say, they just are the same, but of amateurs then riding and whatever Patrick Mullins is there for trying to push for and get on to Manil may well be that horse then for him this year. But it is, it's a, it's something that I don't feel has actually been spoken about all that much or, or acknowledged all that much. The fact that these two races are just unbelievably similar nowadays. But uh, yeah, it, it's throwing a bit of confusion into the antipost mix for sure. Now, James, whilst we're on, um, or whilst we're on the line about novice chases, the majority of us were obviously treated to a spectacle of top class talent around the two mile trip of these novice chases and uh, I say the majority because anyone associated with John Bond may think otherwise from what we've seen over the Christmas period because we had well, St. Roy uh, winning on Boxing Day at Leopard Sound, Boot Hill winning at Kempton on the 27th not to be dismissive but I mean Boot Hill's probably going to go um, grand annual anyway uh, but probably more importantly Dysart Dynamo blowing away his rivals at Leopard Sound the 27th, El Fabiolo at Fairy House on the 21st appreciate it dominating a beginner's chase at Punch Town on the 19th so, I mean, this arc, James, this could be the race of the festival. Oh, it could be, couldn't it? Uh, and Willie Mullins tr truly did unleash his big guns, didn't he, for everyone to see. Um, and it was fantastic. I think just before the, like the Christmas period and during the Christmas period, 
um, El Fabiolo, Dice Art Dino, and uh, appreciate the ones I'm going to focus on. St. Ra, I think, is an absolutely great horse, and obviously he's gone on to win the grade one in, in that division. But I think the three we, we really want to talk about are horses that are going to go on and probably be better than, than that horse. That's how much Arsenal he's got in this division. Um, when looking through all their races, I thought what showed for me, and we haven't seen El Fabiolo as much compared to probably the others, but El Fabiolo, out of the three appreciated Dice Art Dynamo, probably didn't jump the greatest, but showed he has a serious, serious engine. And I think this horse will want to go up in trip um, going forward. I think the same with Appreciate It. I thought he jumped well. It was great to see. But like I was talking about stats before, I think stats is something that just come into play when it comes into the Arkle. And a nine-year-old winning the Arkle is not something you see a lot at all. Um, it's not likely to be seen in a lot of novices races, but I would think in, in time Appreciate will go up in trip as well. So the one I came down on, the one that I think all John Bond fans, have, and, and myself, because I'm a huge fan of John Bond, has got to be scared of, um, is Dice Art Dynamo. Um, I thought about Dice Art Dynamo last season, obviously going over the hurdles, when he did meet the grade one stars like your Constitution or your John Bonds, and obviously over in Ireland, he did crumble to some extent. I don't think that was the true showing of Dice Art Dynamo. We all always know what this horse is going to do. He's going to book out in front. He's going to try and jump everyone onto submission and keep on galloping. And if he can do this over fences and keep jumping the way he did the first way around, he, at what, five, six to one in the market with William Hill? He's got to be considered a massive each way player in that Arkle. The only problem is we've got to see it more often against the better against the better horses. He, he, the way he comes out and, and goes and just free spirited. I absolutely love that about the horse. I thought it was taking how he jumped. I thought it was taking how he travelled. Um, we've got to see it against better horses. But he was the one for me out of those three Mullins ones um, in the Arkle market that I, I think makes the mo most sense. We know he's going to stay over the two miles. And I, I thought, what, 10 to 1 to 6 to 1? I thought that was fair. And I thought if, if you're a John Bond backer, he's the one to be scared of. He's therefore the one to be scared of. Because like you say, I mean, how does Willie Mullins split these three up and which ones are going to go up in trip? And like you say, at this stage, Dice Art Dynamo looks like the one where he should really be staying over the two mile trip anyway. So yeah, that's going to be it looks like Sorry, Kate, it just looks like he's the one he wants the most pace. Like if you look at the Arkle, it's run at a furious pace. And even though when you flip it over to Supreme and Willie's when it with stays in the plas like plas classical dream, when you go over fences, they're just absolutely so slick over their fences. And this horse is exactly what he wants. He wants to test them all, go from the front and try and be as quick as he can. Where if you look at El Fabiola, the way he jumps, he might not be able to jump as quick, just off the base of his first first run over fences, as quick as some of the horses in the Arkle might do. And appreciate it. I've always thought he wants a trip. If you look in the Supreme and, and even if you look back to the Champion Hurdle, he is a quick horse, but I think he, he's so big, he could go further. Uh, and Dice Art Dino for me was the one I just thought would suit the article the most out of the ones we've seen. Yeah, exactly. A big old numb Western ahead on him is probably one of the factors why he needs to be staying over the two more trip. But yeah, and then appreciate it, hopefully, to step up as he'll be 10 come the festival. Now, we do obviously have so much racing to talk about, but unfortunately, this show is meant to only be around 45 minutes long. So I just want to finish off this review section with the superstar of National Hunt Racing, as it would be remiss of me not to, despite it being another cakewalk for Constitution Hill, who Nick was yet again faultless in the Christmas hurdle at Kempton on Boxing Day. So what were your takeaways from his? performance uh, well a few takeaways Kate the fact that turning for home it looked as though Epaton might get a bit closer to him than she had done at Newcastle yeah she appeared to be going and traveling just as well if not better than she had done the previous time and when she'd won the race the previous year and at the line there were 17 lengths between them so that's what was astonishing for me. It's this. It's his finishing speed. He stopped the clock in 3.51. He was only two seconds quicker than Rare Edition in the opening two-mile novices hurdle. But I, I, haven't, I haven't done this yet, and I'm waiting for somebody who can time these things better than me to do it. I'm pretty convinced that he's he must have come home very, very fast because I think they dawdle to three hours. And it's that push-button acceleration that sets him apart. He can just kill a race stone dead, and whenever his rider wants him to. You know, certain free-going horses, they can rip the guts out of a race in the middle, and then they'll they'll struggle home, but they've got so much in hand that they'll still win. He's a horse that you can you can engage whenever you want him to engage, and he'd stay as far as you wanted him to as well. He's, he's just deadly. I just don't see any horse getting anywhere near him um, mm -hmm. if he stands up and remains in, in one piece. Yeah, I completely agree there. And like you say, just when he thought dear old Epiton was actually going to threaten him, 
boom, he just completely put it, put in the the jet power then. But uh, yeah, and Epiton ended up getting beaten by further as a result of that poor old Epiton. But uh, yeah, he really was absolutely blinding. Now, James, I'm going to leave the door open to you, please, for anything else that caught your eye over the festive period. Yeah, I'll just finish with a few, because obviously we, I could be here forever talking about these horses. Um, the one that I've mentioned previously on the podcast before that was in 10 to 1 into 4 to 1 off the back of her running in, in, in like a, a grade 3 juvenile hurdle. But now... She's gone in grade two at Leopard Sound. That was Lossy Mouth. I think she's into six to four now with William Hill. Um, I personally think that was one of the most impressive performances of the Christmas period. I said I said when she was into four to one, she was the most likely winner. And I'd probably back her at four to one. And I'm glad I did because at six to four now, she's very, very sure. But she's very, very talented, isn't she? She's uh, an absolute superstar. For the same connections at Limerick, um, I think it was yesterday we were recording uh, obviously on Thursday, but yesterday at Limerick and was Allegory de Vassi. I've been waiting to see her um, go over fences. She jumped the last two. You would like to see her jump the last two better. But personally for me, she's got serious, serious engine. And even though the mayor's chase I was talking about impervious before, that I think actually has changed hands now over to JP McManus, which is interesting. Mm. But Allegory de Vassi, I think it's five to one into five to two. Um, for the Mayor's Chase. And we know Willie Mullins has won the last two Renaults of that race with obviously two good horses, of Cole Reeve and Ellie May. Um, so I thought she was really, really interesting. And then just obviously Fasal Vega was, was, was good. He did his job, hasn't really changed much in the market. But the final one uh, in the Supreme and maybe the Ballymore market that was actually, I think, just slightly before Christmas was Impair A Pass. Um, and he won a maiden hurdle over two mile three by 18 lengths with William Mill. He went from 25s into 10s for the Supreme. He's actually sevens with William Mill for the Ballymore. He's a horse for Simon uh, Manier and Isaac Sway. <laughs> you want to go back and watch that. The 18 lengths victory was superb. And just for Willie Mullins, obviously he's got Fasal Vega, Gaelic Warrior, um, all these horses. But this was one I really uh, take note of and I want to follow throughout the season. So they're just a few over the Christmas period that away from the obvious um, were ones that I, I, I had a look at, yeah. Oh, I like that. Yeah, Imperi passed 10 to 1, then cut him from 25 to 1 for the Supreme. I mean, he was really, really impressive. But thank you very much, James, for that list for us to go out then with some out-of-the-box sort of thinking with some of those horses to look forward to. Now we move on to our Cheltenham Festival anti-post race in focus section, where we will be looking ahead to the Mayor's Hurdle, everyone's favourite race. I don't want to hear otherwise. And uh, here at William Hill... We currently have the race priced up as Honeysuckle as our 9 to 4 market leader, Epitont at 5 to 1, Brandy Love 5 to 1, Love Envoy at 8 to 1, Marie's Rock at 8 to 1, Queensbrook at 10 and it's 12 to 1 bar. So, Nick, we're playing a bit of a guessing game at this stage with which, which mares are actually going to run in this race. So, how do you see the mares hurdle at this stage? I don't think Honeysuckle will run in it. I mean, Peter uh-huh. Maloney did a brilliant interview in the TDN the other day with Brian Sheeran where he said she's more likely to be retired than running the mares hurdle. And the only thing is, you know, she'd only be retired if she runs badly in the in the Irish champion hurdle. So I, I, I mean, no matter what happens to Constitution Hill between now and then, if anything, I, I, I'm working on the basis that Honeysuckle is going to run in the champion hurdle. Epaton, I suspect, might run in the mayor's hurdle, um, in which case she'd probably be a fair price. But would she have lost the winning habit by then? And. And would you rather not take a chance that a horse is going to improve past her? You know, that that there's a horse that is going to take a step forward to be able to make a mark in the sort of mid 150s and um, and and go there in the form of her life. And the the one that appeals to me, to be honest, is 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 Love Envoy, who won the novice race last year. The way she came back and won at Sandown against males under a big weight suggested to me she'd improved again. You know this is the race she's going to be targeted at. You know also that you can build in any amount of improvement for the step up to, to two and a half from two last year. And I, I think I think she's the way I would be looking. I think we're going to get diverted so much by the Will Honeysuckle or Epaton running this race chat between now and then that we might not be able to see the wood for the trees. And I, I, I think Harry Fry's mare is, a, is pretty talented. Mm, like you say exactly with all the um yeah what everything that we're going to be talking about between trying to decide exactly which mares are going to be heading to this race are we just completely ignoring the obvious and again this is where we can potentially use the antipost markets to our advantage with eight to one about love envoy where like you say we know where she is going to end up after winning the novice version of this race then at last year's Cheltenham festival so yeah love envoy looks a, a pretty obvious way to go then at that price james what are your thoughts 
Yeah, I think I think what Nick said absolutely bang on. When you've got Honeysuckle and Epitont near the top of the market, and even though I do think Epitont will run in this race because I think he's obviously she's been a great horse, but it's pointless going for the champion hurdle now. Um, I think you're right about Honeysuckle with, with obviously hearing the interviews that she owes nothing to the sport whatsoever. She's already won a mayor's hurdle, and it was actually a really good mayor's hurdle against Benny Did You. So to go when you're going to chasing it but back to back to back champion hurdles, even if you've lost your like you've lost your title now. I'd go for it. I think the only way she won't go for it is if, like you say, if she, if she runs really poorly um, in the Irish champion hurdle. And why wouldn't you pull up stumps then and go and send her uh, to stud? But I would love to see her in the champion hurdle. I hope she doesn't go for this race. I don't think she needs to. She owes nothing to the sport, so she doesn't need to prove another grade one. But from, like you said, Kate, from an anti-post perspective, it's great to have her in this market because you can find a bit of value. Um, and personally, for me, I really do like one. Look, I respect the English uh, I really, really do. I understand Nick's point about Love Envoy. I, I think I, eight to one, she's a cracking uh, a cracking prize for this race. Um, obviously, you've got Marie's Rock in there, currently around 10 to one, won the race last year, won back-to-back grade ones, obviously going to Punchstown as well, beating Epiton last year. So you'd like to look at the prices and think if Marie's Rock, and she's actually entered in the Real Kill Hurdle, which we'll talk about later. We don't know if she's going to run yet, but it's nice to see her entered. Um, but the one I came down on for this race at five to one was Brandy Love for Willie Mullins. Um, and look, we haven't seen her yet this season. That's my worry. I haven't really heard too much um, about her as well. But I think on raw ability alone, this six-year-old could be very, very talented. I think she'd have gone very close last year in the Mayor's Novices before being pulled out. She obviously then went to Fairy House and won a grade one, beating Love Envoy by eight lengths. It's very different to say Love Envoy had five, six runs that season, whereas Brandy Love probably had two runs. So it's hard to hard to really uh, convert both both lots lots of form. Um, but if you look at what she did in a bumper days, if you look what she's actually done over hurdles as well, when she lost to Alagor de Vassi um, in a grade three at Fairy House, she jumped so far left, it's untrue. But if you look at how she stayed on at the end, she's got a serious motor. She's got a real big engine. And for me, if she can put it all together, if you look at how she jumped back at Fairy House when beating Love Envoy, much better. I think I need to see her a few more times, but currently at five to one, if she goes out next time and wins, she will definitely not be five to one. Um, so for me at the moment, the way I would play it would be Brandy Love. Yeah, like I say, just to check on her well-being, but she has, as you say, on that final start of last season, beaten Love Envoy. There may be mitigating circumstances as to why Love Envoy wasn't able to, to show her best form on that occasion, but even so, yeah, Brandy Love, and going the right way around as well around Cheltenham, exactly. <laughs> going left. I don't know how she still managed to win at Fairy House, but uh, on that final start, but yeah, Brandy Love then, five to one shot for that engine to put to good use, provided she turns up there in one piece. And she also um, actually makes it to the race as well. Then so five to one. So I think I've got both of your selections. So love envoy for Nick and James, you are going for Brandy Love. So two horses with intertwining form lines from last season. Right so now it's the time to look forward to the very near future as good racing continues this weekend on New Year's Eve and New Year's Day, where we have top class action at both Newbury and at Cheltenham. And we'll begin by looking at the Chalo Novices Hurdle, which comes up on Saturday. If you can remember what day of the week it, it even is at this stage. Um, but yeah, we have a lot more runners than we were initially expecting for this race. So James, um, yeah, a lopsided market, but how are you assessing the Chalo at this stage? Well, yeah, we were talking off air just before and we couldn't believe, could we, that what, 14 are going to post for, for yeah. the Chalo? Uh, and obviously we, we've jumped on uh, on air for this straight away. So we'd love to check how many runners over the last few years has actually been, but it's never been as big as these fields. Um, for this race. Obviously, Paul Nichols has got a cracking record over the last two years. He also won it with Denman um, and before that stage star Brave Man's Game. And he's got obviously the top of the market here, hasn't he, with Hermes Allen. Hermes Allen um, was one of the most expensive point of horse horses uh, seen this year, uh, costing 350000 at Cheltenham's December meeting. Um, but from what he's done over hurdles <laughs> both times, at Stratford by winning by 27 lengths, he just looked a bit of a freak that day, didn't he? And then when going to Cheltenham, booked out in front and went on to win by nine lengths, beating some quite nice horses, actually. Obviously, we spoke to Sam Tristan Davis, didn't we? And we've all been caught with behind him that day. They think very highly of that horse. A brisker for Willie Mullins came over. I think it was probably a fact-finding mission, wasn't it, to see where that horse lies against these horses. Um, and that day, he went from 33s into 10s for the Ballymore. Um, I think he wins this race. Uh, I know there's 14 going to post, but I just think... From the way Paul Nichols' record's been, um, comparing this horse to these, I think this this horse is, is going to be up there with you likes of Brave Man's Game and probably going to be better than Stage Star. Um, I know it's a tougher run all, but 
Uh, I think he's going to win this race. The one I would play each way at this point, currently around 10 to 1 in the market, is Attica for Nicky Henderson. We talked about this horse on a previous episode when beating Master Chewy, uh, when we spoke to Sam Tristan Davis. But when I was talking about this horse, I wanted to see him go up to two mile four. It's exactly what he's got here. I think he's a stayer in the making. At 10 to 1, I, I can't wait to see him over this trip because he just doesn't give up. And the way uh, Nico de Boinville rode him last time out was absolutely brilliant. I hope he gives him a very similar ride. So from a win perspective, I think Hermes Allen's going to be very difficult to beat, but uh, not far behind him. Attica for Nicky Henderson for me. Oh, I like it then. Yeah, so so two ways to play this race, or you can do the forecast, or, or whichever. James has given you multiple options there anyway. So 11 to 10 about Hermes Allen. It's Joan Machan, if Paul Nolan then is going to take his chance across the Irish Sea at 8 to 1. Vicky Vale, 8 to 1. Attica, 10s. Idalco, Biu, 12 to 1, 14 to 1. Barnick. So we, James just touched on there with Paul Nichols's record in the race and the fact that he's bidding for a hat trick in this race as well with Brave Man's Game and Stage Star winning the last few renewals. In your mind, I mean, A, are you siding with Hermes Allen? and B, if you are, where do you think he ranks in comparison to those two former winners of this race? Well, it's the fact that also in Stage Star's year and in Brave Man's Games year, Paul Nichols really only had one horse he could realistically run in this race. You know, he had lots of nice young horses, obviously he always does, but they were really the only horse he was ever talking about running here. The difference this year is that there are three or four he could have run here. Um, all of whom have shown quite a lot of talent. And he made no hesitation in nominating MS Allen about a month ago for this. The way he jumped at Cheltenham really was the most striking aspect of his performance for me. It was the economy of effort, the speed with which he got from one side of the hurdle to the other. I think he's probably the fastest horse in this race, uh, but who wants to be playing him at that kind of price? You know, he's already, what is he, six to five, James? Yeah, six to five, yeah. I mean, that's tight, isn't it? In a a 14-runner race where there's so much potential, a a lot of it's guessology. You know, Joao Machin's got more form to go at and was very impressive last time, but that win's taken a, a couple of big knocks over the Christmas period from a form perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it's interesting that Gordon Elliott has another go at him with the third Kansas City star, but the runner-up's been thrashed over, over Christmas. So I think I'd be looking elsewhere for an alternative. I take James's point about Attica. Nothing not to like about what he's done so far. The horse that really intrigued me was Jamie Snowden's one right down the bottom. Um, Snowden had three in here initially. He's gone for two, passing well, and you wear it well. You wear it well clearly is the pick on 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 jockey bookings, uh, and and has been kept a minor track so far. Ludlow, Catrick, Worcester, and Hexham. But he's absolutely bolted up the last three times. He looks to have lots of pace. They've clearly saved him for this, and he ought to improve for the step up in trip. And I don't think he'll mind if there's a bit more rain either. So I think he'd be the he'd be the no, oh, he's not exactly a wild one. He's three from four. But he'd be the the darker one, I think, that I'd be interested in. Yeah, 14 to 1 then, like you say, all kept to those smaller, smaller tracks and throughout your Catrix, Worcesters and Hexans, but certainly form not to be underestimating anyway for Jamie Snowden. Seemingly first string there, Gavin Sheen booked on you wear it well. So like that Again, angle a lot. Jamie Snowden's quite a shrewd operator. He's yeah. he's sitting there with a horse that's rated 125. Mm-hmm. You know. You could be talking about winning a serious handicap hurdle or two with, with, and winning a lot of money with a, with a horse if you think he's well weighted. He, uh, you know, sticking him straight in a grade one, yeah, that handicap mark's going to get blown if he runs well, but they might not mind. No, exactly. Yeah, and interesting then as well. And with the seven pound mayor's allowance that she's going to be receiving too, it's just going to be fascinating to see exactly why they have taken this quite brave decision to therefore run, uh, run over then in the Chalo novices hurdle all the same. So, ah, oh, I like this. I like these ways to play this race. Now on New Year's Day, we're back to Cheltenham, where the Grade Two Dipper novices chase and the Grade Two Rail Kill hurdle are the feature contest. So Nick, starting with the Dipper, please. And it's that man again, Paul Nichols, who has the favourite Mon Morale at six to four, but right. Back Behind him, Thunderock for the banging form Ollie Murphy team, eight to one about Beauport, which is also the price about Bold Endeavour, and ten to one bar about the remaining five entries, because obviously we don't have depths at this stage. So, how are you assessing this race, Nick? Uh, I'm assessing it in that I probably want to be taking on Mon Morale, even though I accept the fact that he came up against a wonderful horse in John Bonnet at, at Warwick. Um, I just think he's the sort of horse who's who at this stage of his career, uh, his his price. It, Always appears to um, always appears to be based more on his more on his reputation, I think, than his actual achievement. I know he was a very very good juvenile hurdler, but if you go back, what was he actually beating during that season? What was he actually achieving? You know, since since he's been in in senior company, since he's been out of juvenile company, I'm not sure that his form necessarily would entitle him to to that sort of price. So I, I would be um, 
inclined if Beauport runs to forgive one poor run because I'm a forgiving kind of guy. <laughs> I think he bounced off his big effort at Carlisle, to be honest, next yeah. time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think many people would agree with you that as well. And he has been freshened up since an eight to one then about Beauport at this stage. Of course, we are just looking at this race from, um, well, without any declaration. So it is just trying to try and guess exactly which horses are going to rock up here. But James, your your opinion on the dipper? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll be with uh, in Nick's camp here. I'll be taking on Mon Morale. Uh, I think if you look at the moment, the ground's good at Cheltenham. There is showers supposed to fall, so he will. I don't think even if it's good ground, he won't He won't run it as well because he said that in the past. I think Mon Morale's the wrong favourite anyway. Um, and for that reason, I wanted to take him on. And Thunder Rock was the one I'd play here if going. Uh, he's currently jocked up, but we all we all know that Adrian Heskin was going to ride him anyway. Um, and we have got to wait to see it officially uh, declared. But for me, if you, if you look at Thunder Rock, he's the highest rated chaser in the field of what rated 150 having won a handicap the time before yes he's going up into grade two company here but from the from his two runs uh, and last time shown at ascot he was absolutely he was absolutely superb I, I can understand nick's case about Beauport, and i could actually forgive that run as well he was giving away a lot of weight um and to be fair he probably, he probably want to drop more rain as well in all honesty yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he probably would but if, if, i think if you look at thunder rocky he, he's got no problem on good ground um, uh, and even if he did go, go to good to soft, he's won on that before as well. I think he should be the favourite because he isn't the favourite. That would be the way I'd play at the, uh, this stage for me. And I, Ollie Murphy, I, I really do like Ollie Murphy. I think he's got some cracking horses in training that maybe some are really well handicapped. And I hope he goes on to finally get that Ch Channel Festival winner this season. So, yeah, Thunder Rock for me. Uh, and obviously this race last year was won by Long Press. So I don't think we've got a horse in here like that. But um, it's obviously a, a race to, to go on to see horses that potentially could go to the festival. So in that race, it would be Thunder Rock for me at this stage. Yeah, and the banging form Ollie Murphy at the minute as well, hasn't he? It's all of a sudden just come to the fore, all of his horses running very, very well. Now, we also have the aforementioned feature race on Sunday, which is the Grade 2 Rail Kill Hurdle, where Maurice Rock, who we spoke about earlier, is the current 5 to 2 favourite, who's 8 to 1 price tag for the Mayor's Hurdle. Maybe clicked him on the back of this, should she prove successful, from I Like to Move It 3 to 1, Nathas Hill 4 to 1, 5 to 1 bar. So it's a hot contest from the betting front, at least, James, anyway. So your play, please. Yeah, she's fascinating if she turns up, isn't she? Five to two, look, it is short for a horse that you, you haven't seen for, what, since Punchestown last season. And again, she's coming back out of Mayor's company uh, to go against the boys. Um, I thought of five to two, she might just be a bit skinny for her first run of the season, even even though she, she is a really remarkable horse, looking to make it four out of four. A horse, you probably might know where I'm going with this, Kate, because if he does go, Nappers Hill is a horse I really, really do like. I've got no problem going back up to two mile four. He missed his engagement, obviously, in the international hurdle when Cheltenham was off. He was also entering the Christmas hurdle, but didn't go. They probably thought, you know what, we won't go there. We'll put him back up to two mile four. We'll come here. It's an easier race. He wasn't going to beat Constitution Hill. I think he's currently around four to one in the market. Yep. Um, yeah. uh, obviously, off the back of winning that grade two elite hurdle, beating So Royal in his backyard. <laughs> I've got no problem playing Nappas Hill here at four to one. He's going to be fresh. Um, and the two mile four doesn't scare me at all. So I thought looking at the prices, he was the one I, I would go for in this one. Yeah, Nappas Hill. Oh, I like it. Yeah, four to one. But it's so condensed, this market, even at this stage anyway. But yeah, Nappas Hill to continue his unbeaten. Well, yeah, that succession of wins, basically, anyway. Yeah. And it, I mean, these two mile and two and a half mile hurdlers, they've all been chucked together because we've lost so many yeah. of these uh, of these races. I mean, it's great for us from a spectacle, at least anyway. So uh, so we know that James is liking Nappas Hill. But do you sort of factor in the fact that we've got that extra half a mile for this race? A little bit. I mean, I I, just, I think because you've got horses from all disciplines here, you know, two milers like I like to move it so far and first street horses who are coming back in trip like you know, Dash or Drasher yeah. wants a bit further than this and slightly softer ground. If, if he runs, brewing up a storm can certainly go further than this. You know, I, I think you, the likelihood is this will be a proper test. Um, and, you know, so it does it does change the complexion of it. I I a massive first street fan if he runs. Um, I don't I again I don't have any issue with him getting the trip but I think the key to him is a strongly run race mm. I think he wants to be switched off of, of, of a strong pace and I think that's that's more than likely what he'll get on good ground I thought that was a really good effort at Newbury and I, I he showed a bit more resolve and um a tenacity than I'd given him credit for last year when I thought he was a little bit of a bridle horse I thought that was a hell of an effort to give two stone to his um to the runner up at Newbury on, on what was nearly good to firm ground uh, and win and it won't be far off that if, if we don't get any rain at Cheltenham so he'd be he'd be my pick
if he yeah, was. Yep. First Street as well, hasn't he? He's got the form of state man, hasn't he? From yeah. from that county hurdle. Obviously, we're recording today on Thursday when the Matheson hurdle is going to be run. We could see state man frank that form again. We don't know at this time, but that form alone, you're right. I, I did look at that and think if he can turn out to be the horse that not going to be as good as state man, but to follow in the footsteps of where he's gone with his career, he was obviously better than the mark that's shown. Um, yeah, I thought he was interesting as well, Nick. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, to, see, to my eye, he's the sort of horse who could be a finishing third in the champion hurdle type of horse. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Exactly, which is going to make him fascinating then for this race as well. And if he goes and wins this, but like you say, kind of looking at the champion hurdle at this stage, you are probably looking for those horses that are going to try and fill the frame and at big and post prices currently. And if First Street goes and wins there, well, yeah, he looks a bit of a gimme for that race. So yeah, First Street to hopefully confirm the earlier promise. Now, James, before we wrap up, I just want to head to you, please, for anything else that's caught your eye over the weekend at this stage. Of course, we haven't given you much time for this. <laughs> Yeah, so just the one uh, I'd mention off the back of the races we've covered, um, and Jet Powered's obviously been declared for uh, the introductory hurdle at Newbury. He's obviously second favourite at the moment for the Supreme uh, link with Marine National. I think he's around 6, 7, 20 in the market. If he goes and wins in that race, he's going to be much sure, isn't he? So I'd, I'd definitely have a look at that. And we also, uh, for talking about Hermes Allen before, we have a little special that we should be on the bottom of the screen that he's now 16 to 1 to win. Uh, the Chalo hurdle and then go win the Ballymore. So if you're going to back him, he's obviously going to be short for the Ballymore as well. So they're just the things I bring your attention to. But it's obviously, we've had a great Christmas period, but some also fascinating racing towards the festival as well over the next few days. Oh, yeah, exactly. And, and nicely done. Ever the professional then, James, for, for that offer and highlighting that. So thank you for that. Definitely a few people will be trying to take advantage of that. Right. That is almost everything from us from episode four of the Inside Track brought to you by William Hill. But before I let the lads go, Nick, I just ask for one horse, one antipose selection for the Cheltenham Festival, please. Well, why don't we why don't we end where we started, Kate? <laughs> I mean, as things stand at the moment, what's wrong with Paisley Park at 14 to 1? Exactly. Exactly. I love it. And the case was made and then some earlier on. I am completely there. You'll see a sea of blue now across his anti-post um, markets then for Paisley Park for the say title. We know where he's going to go. So I love that angle. So thank you so much to Nick and for Jane for all of the, their hard work on this bumper edition of the Inside Track. We will be back with you next week. So we look forward to catching up with you then.